CLS 062 with Yuri. Yuri, how are you doing, man? Hey, doing good. How are you? Awesome, man. Doing good. Doing good. It, it feels great because I feel like I don't have to explain the uh, the intro music to you. No. Because we've heard a couple times <laughs> on normal stuff before. <laughs> Not Je at Jeff all. was very, very proud of, of this work he did making this song. Hey, B-Man's here. Hey, B-Man. Hey. Hope you're doing well, man. <laughs> But yeah, um, uh, so so Yuri, you just had a course come out earlier this week, and I feel like you've been doing like all kinds of events and stuff <laughs> for for like promoting it. And uh, but you were at a conference recently, right? I don't want to misspeak and say the wrong conference. Was yeah, a couple of them. Like uh, while well, like the spring was pretty calm, and I actually enjoyed it. Like uh, you know, COVID stuff and all of those things going on. So. I kind of enjoyed like not being at conferences, not interacting too much. Although you would actually think the opposite, right? Because like if you're in lockdown, you you actually should have like the the kind of the necessity to speak to more people. But I kind of enjoyed yeah. the kind of a calm time there. Hmm. But now, like since yeah, I think like since beginning of October, there have been a couple of conferences, a GDG event in Italy, which was in Italian, which was quite a struggle to be honest. Because like Italian is my second language, actually, it's not my mother tongue; okay. it's German. But like to have a talk in Italian, like about technical stuff, where you usually just speak in English, was super hard. Like, yeah, but yeah, it worked is, out nicely. Is English your third language then? Yeah, English is my third language. Yeah. Do, do you do you speak any others? No, no, unfortunately okay. not. Like um, German is my mother tongue, and Italian we have it. I think like since I I had it since secondary second elementary school onwards. Nowadays okay. they have it even from the first elementary school, and we had English even just like at last years in high school but nowadays even they also have it like in middle school onwards or something like that yeah but yeah i i took french uh through school and in college but i could not i could not fathom giving a technical talk in french like yeah the thing is like i speak it like recently since i joined now or basically i just speak english all day right so yeah like, that that's what i usually do but before like i worked at companies where like 50% were Italians. And so like speaking Italian was kind of normal. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always hard to talk about technical stuff I find in, 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 in anything else than in English. Because like that's how you read it. Like that's what you read, what you write, what you talk about in general at conference. And so. Yeah. It's interesting. But yeah, it was fun. Yeah. Yeah, B-Man agrees here. But it's interesting oh, yeah. <laughs> because German, it seems like it's a language specialized or optimized for being able to talk about uh, technical things, but <laughs> because you you can like stick together words, is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it, <laughs> yeah, seems, yeah, yeah. it just seems very um, utilitarian. Like like an engineer maybe <laughs> designed this, while well, maybe a poet created like yeah, French yeah. And English. So I don't know. And I think the nice thing about German in general as language is that it's very easy to go to other languages. Right, mm -hmm. because like yeah. German like covers more the Nordic languages. Like also yes. English is kind of more related to German than probably to Italian. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having also the Italian side is kind of nice because like you you it should be it should be easier to also go into the Spanish direction, which I never tried. Like we were on a vacation in Spain a couple of times, and so you kind of understand what people are saying to you, but it, you can't really talk to them, right? Yeah, <laughs> so you understand that. what they are asking, but it's hard to yeah. talk. To. So my, my dad is is pretty much a full blood Dutch. Uh, both of his parents oh. were, um, you know, were, were also born in the U.S. But I think they were they were second generation off the boat. Uh, okay, Dutch immigrants, and so he he got a good bit of Dutch growing up, and then he got he started taking German in school, and he realized very quickly that like. Dutch is just like a, a, a poor man's German, <laughs> kind of. Yeah. yeah. Like a, very watered down. <laughs> oh, we yeah, like I don't know Dutch. <laughs> yeah. yeah my, my mom is Dutch. mainly Irish, so I, I'm like uh, half Dutch, half Irish, maybe. So oh, nice. Nice. But yeah. Cool. <laughs> Anyways, uh, let, let me let me share the link here in case anyone's interested in it. This is the new, this is the new course. That we've got yep. up scale React development with NX. So, so you're 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 mainly Angular, is that right? Um, yeah, yeah. When that, that's where. Getting, when did you start getting into React? Um, I'm still 
kind of like it, that was also something that's always kind of on the side, basically, right? So Angular is what like how I mostly came into the whole front end scene. I started with something else first, which was called I don't remember JavaScript MVC, something like that. JavaScript MVC, and I think that nowadays it's called CanJS or DoneJS, which was mm -hmm. which uh, was actually a pretty good framework. But it was at the times where jQuery was more like the ones people used. And there was kind of something on top of jQuery where you can and could have like models and stuff. And it was pretty good, but it, it kind of lacked the community. And so like the next step was at that company at the time, we searched something where there's more community involvement. And so kind of we we jumped over to Angular.js and then which which was my start in the whole Angular community. So that's okay. definitely like 90% of what I do is yeah. Angular. But I'm always, it was always kind of always more interested in, gen in general, like in tech, how things work. Uh, even yeah. before, like unrelated to front end or back end development, I always kind of try to stay a bit on top of things. So the fact that I'm going that deep into Angular was an actually never really planned. That was kind of by accident. So that okay. I so much focus on Angular now, even do mostly just front end development or like, yeah, front end architecture if you want. Um, so it was kind of, by accident. And React was always a React, but also Vue. Uh, I never really had time to, to look into it too much. Uh, I started doing like uh, Kenty Dots course, which he published, which is nice because like, you can do it kind of on the side, right? Uh, follow yeah. along a bit. Because I think it's it's good to have, uh, yeah, kind of a broader picture about what's going on. And, and many things even like, like you can like move them over from React to Angular and vice versa, right? The concepts are kind of similar sometimes, like conceptually. And I think like those are the most important parts. Like if you really understand those, then it's kind of easy to switch back and forth. Yeah. But yeah, the, the, the course on ACAD was uh, something, I al actually I always wanted to do something on ACAD about NX, even before I joined Novel. Like I've been using NX, yeah, mostly two years even before I joined Novel. Okay. Um, so from mostly from the very big very get go. Uh, when yeah, came if you're out. using two years before you joined Narwhal, that was pretty much when they. Yeah, started. I remember it was kind of the first stable releases or something. Like we were starting a new project, and I kind of really liked the idea behind the next, like the whole apps and lib structure, and like in general how you can architect applications that way, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of resonated with me. And so like we were like, should we actually jump over it, or should we kind of wait what's like, what's happening with it, like whether it's really getting getting a good start. Uh, but then we just like I uh, screw it and just like used it and like in the worst case I would have to kind of have migrated it back to Angular CLI somehow. But it, that's when I went into the whole NX world and and mostly from that on I kind of always wanted to create a course on ACAD about it. It's just that it never really came along or never really had time for it. Yeah. Uh, and so now we finally I was finally able to get that down. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is. Focus like we target React developers, sort of. That was the main goal. Like it's called scaling React development with NX. But really, like if you know how NX is structured, it's it's like kind of more, yeah, tech agnostic CLI tool if you want, right? So we right now we support Angular, React, and Node out of the box, uh, with some community plugins which even support other stuff. Like I know Beeman also added like Go support, I think, and like there are some awesome yeah. community plugins actually. So it's not just those three languages. Mm -hmm. But I, I've, I found that it might be nice for React developers because like, they might not be so much familiar with the whole. Uh, yeah, sure. And Nest is also like out of the box. Yeah. Even though it's even better than we know. <laughs> 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 yeah. So I was going to mention React that. Developers. I, I like this. And yeah. <laughs> Thanks for the plug. <laughs> for the Go plug in. Thank you for the plug. The plug in. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That was a terrible joke. I'm getting all my dad jokes out today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, man, when when we first came across NX, it was when, um, th this was back when I was at my other company, but we just heard Victor and Jeff's talk. I forget where it was. I thought it was ng-conf, but it sounds like it might have been actually like Angular, um, what, oh, what's the big Euro European one? Angular Connect? Is that? Uh, yeah, Angular Connect is Angular the biggest Connect. one, for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it was there. Uh, but we heard this and we we're like, this is exactly what we need. Uh, because <laughs> because um, we we were just like, we were a shop that came in and made like uh, 
products or, or made a project uh, based on you know some contract. We ju we just handed over like here's the here's the working app. We didn't have to like hand over code or anything like that. And we were just rebuilding everything every time. <laughs> so like we got to the point where we could say, okay, here's like a calendar module. You know, let's just take that off the shelf and we'll use it next time we do this because it's always the same thing. <laughs> like here's a key value pair one. Like to the point where we yeah. were pairing it up with uh, database stuff and all this stuff, so it was super nice for that. To the point where we were getting to where, um, like, th there was one project we had before we before I left. It was like a month before I left. Um, had a new project come in, and it took us like a week to do it. Where normally it would have taken us at least like three months because we, it was just it was just a collection of things we had already built. So we just put it all together and nice. sent it out to QA, and there you go. So. Yeah, that's what I've been talking also recently, that, uh, at, or I've been trying to basically include in my conference talks as well about NX. Is that, I mean, like, you always hear like monorepo, right? Like, that's the main term which you hear with NX, and it's really made for that, right? Yeah. But, like, even that, at my previous company, we weren't that large. We were a couple of people developing like three or four apps maximum. Yeah. But already you get so much benefits because, like, in a small shop, as you say, like if you want to reuse stuff and you actually have to figure out how to publish it to some NPM and you may not, you might not want to publish it to a public one, right? Because yeah. it might still contain like private property of the company. And so like you have to set up an internal one, right? An internal private registry. So it gets really complicated up to the point where people either use Git sub modules to like share code, which is super horrifying. <laughs> Uh, or or they they have to to go for some other solution and there NX is really super, really helpful I think like you can yeah. just like split out stuff reuse it and, and yeah and at least well, see how it way, goes it's, right it's like a double whammy right because you got to figure out all the, the what is it like the sim linking and yeah. and the registries and stuff yeah. like that but there's also like you got to make sure these things keep in sync and you pretty much have to do it manually like if you update a dependency in one you got to update it on the other and it's very easy to miss those. So yeah, it's like good luck. <laughs> and X really <laughs> helps with that. Just just having the one place for, like, just having one. Uh, for for us, it was for our entire organization. One package JSON for for all of our dependencies. That that was yeah. super nice. Yeah, Bman says friends don't let friends use get some modules. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good one, definitely. Yeah, I mean, I'm like sometimes there's no work, used, there's so. no way around it, right? But sometimes it's so like. I feel like whenever I, I'm working on a repository that has Git sub modules, there's always something messing up or something going wrong. Yeah. I feel you, man. Well, um let, let me let me go from this. We we kind of heard a little bit of your story already, just when you were talking about, you know, how you ended up with Angular. But one thing I love talking about with my guests is just like how how did how did you know tech was for you? Like how did you come into tech? What what was what was the driving thing for like for young Yuri? <laughs> how did that's a, <laughs> how did that's you a good question? Yeah, I think like it was. Uh, I think like first it was at like at middle school. I think like in the very first years of middle school, just when like my dad we had a computer at home, like where my dad uh, kind of had a small home office. Mm. Where from now on, then, like he often worked from there, and that was. And now I, I kind of think I, I'm revealing my age, <laughs> but like that was before. At least we didn't have internet here, so it like, no, we didn't have that. And it just came like a couple of years after, like one two years after that, mm. and it was like an old computer which had like Windows 3.1 on it. So it's not yes. too long ago, time ago, but quite a long time ago. And yeah. there are just like basically started typing around in, in Word and like, yeah, kind of just played around with it. I really didn't know, have had any knowledge about programming and stuff. But Word had a, had that nice thing, which I found just by accident, which is what was those macro recordings where you could actually like automate stuff, right? You could like record a macro and then basically click a couple of buttons and it would behind the scenes would like write down code for you and store it somewhere. And then you could actually play, replay that by like creating a toolbar button and then clicking on that, which was like, for me, it was like, whoa, that's super cool. Yeah. And I just started like to play around with that. And that's when I kind of entered into the whole VBA, like uh, VBA scene, right? Like the visual basic for applications, I think was yes. called like inside the whole office package, mm -hmm. which to me was nice because like you had that immediate feedback where you could code something and even create a nice 
UI for it, right? It's like it had those drag and drop buttons. You could like double click and just like add some small pieces of code, which I mostly just like tried around, like with those macros, tried to figure out what was recorded and like cut out the pieces and, and assembled it that way, basically. And those were the first times where I kind of felt like this might be something interesting and like that's something that might might feel appealing like later on. Yeah. Uh, but it was, I didn't actually get immunity into tech then because I, I started more a commercial high school, which had some inform, like, yeah, computer technologies in there. There was kind of a couple of courses which like covered those topics, which I ended up doing all. And so like after that, I decided like at university, I, I want to go computer science full in. Okay. And that's when I really started to to code and to to yeah do some I would say like not not professional coding but yeah some more real coding not just like messing around yeah. with, with stupid small macros. What so what was it like uh, coding in university for you? Were like what, were they teaching you like C or assembly or low level stuff or was it um, did you to like some JavaScript or stuff or no no JavaScript at all like JavaScript okay. at that time wasn't that popular like it was around like we at that uh the, at those computer courses at, at high school we actually did some javascript but that was usually not more than just grabbing an input do some stupid calculations and then or like putting out an alert inside an html code or something like that do augment based your html code there wasn't wasn't really logic being programmed in those javascripts right you know, at university i i was kind of lucky because like that university was more uh, practice oriented like we always had kind of in the mornings more the theoretical stuff where they teach you all the the like the low level foundational things you have to know like mathematics even and, and those kind of like theoretical things mm -hmm. algorithms and stuff but then in the afternoons we usually had kind of programming classes so there were more like projects which like usually span throughout like half a year where you work like with two or three people on it and the first thing i, I think mostly we did java and then even went into Android programming because like Android came out like on those last years. And so like some projects even were like where you had to s develop like a small Android application and, and fiddle around with yeah. that. So it was pretty practical. And I also liked the style of like coding in groups because like that even reflected kind of how the reality afterwards would be, right? Where you work in a small team where you code something and develop some, some apps with that. Yeah. So it was Java. Java was the first real language which which I... Which I started to learn, and, and then also C and C plus plus, but those were just like on the side for some kind of couple of courses. We had to use that one mm -hmm. uh, for more low level programming and algorithm stuff. Gotcha. So you, you know the 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 pain of the pointers in the oh yeah by yeah. reference. Yeah. <laughs> they taught us that. Yeah. I often found that the whole point of learning us like C plus plus was to to have us suffer and like get to know <laughs> so what, what it means like. It. If you... yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh man, just 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 remembering like the like creating a string even. You had you had to use like the pointers to to yeah. figure all that out and like you couldn't resize arrays like uh, just because you're 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 working with the memory, right? So an array is literally all these pieces of memory next to each other and understanding yeah. what that actually means and the and then getting into linked lists and thinking this is so cool. <laughs> I could just add another one. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good times. Good times with low-level programming. But yeah, so so, how do you feel about Java? I, I too ended up doing a lot of Java in college and, and in my first job too. And I hated it. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious if you have similar feelings towards it. Yeah, I, I think like... Um... I didn't really, like, I, I wouldn't say I hated it when I learned because it was my first language, right? So initially, like, uh, I found it super interesting, super fascinating. And then we also, like, kind of implemented or used it in different variations because we developed uh, Android applications where, sure, you always use Java as your language, but then you deal with different packages, different stuff. And, like, um, I wouldn't say I hated it. It was mostly when... When I came to to actual work, like when I started working, I actually after my bachelor studies, I started working part time, like half a day, and continuing my master studies. Mm -hmm. And that, that job, basically, which was mostly working for the public government, uh, we I was like thrown into the .NET department department where they mostly just did .NET development. There was also a Java department, but for some reason they searched someone in the .NET department. They was were like when they hired me, uh, sure you mostly did Java so far, but what would you say like doing .NET 
from now on. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? Like, it's learning something new, like opportunity to grow. Yeah, C Sharp and like, Java are super close, right? Yeah, they're super close. And at that point, .NET, I think like initially, it was even behind. Like when I switched over from Java, like a lot of stuff like generic lists and stuff were completely missing in .NET. And I was like, mm. you cannot use that language. Like it's impossible. Like you have to use plain arrays and like they're not typed. And it was really kind of kind of weird to use. Um, yeah. But then it got ahead very, very quickly. Like they quickly introduced like Lambda expressions and more functional stuff into .NET, which was super cool. Uh, even link you and like where you could like query your database based on like uh, writing it in natural language based inside your .NET code. So really cool concepts. And that's where I really started to like it. And basically at that time for a couple of years, I mostly did just .NET. And then I did a bit both parts of that company since I kind of was more moving between teams, like helping multiple teams. And so some teams did Java and so helped out there and kind of mm -hmm. jumping back and forth. Um, but yeah, like Java catched up a bit. Uh, but if I would have to choose nowadays, I probably would go .NET direct. I feel like they're innovating a lot more, even recently. Yeah. Like they're doing some pretty cool stuff, even with .NET Core, which unfortunately I wasn't able to keep up much uh, lately. Uh, but I'm just like kind of following along with the news and, and stuff they release. So it's pretty cool stuff. Even with the whole open source strategy, which Microsoft recently has, it's even more appealing, I feel. Yeah. Because before, like, people were always kind of, yeah, but it's a closed source and, like, Microsoft's evil and <laughs> stuff. So, yeah. I don't know. I, it, Microsoft has definitely been doing some really cool stuff lately. Like, VS Code, uh, yeah. like, like not, not, not Visual Studio, like, the full thing, but just VS Code feels just like a love letter to developers to me. It's, yeah. it, to, in my opinion, it's so good. I know, uh, Victor and a lot of Narwhal people now like WebStorm, but I, I just love code, <laughs> VS Code. So yeah, I've been using it for years. Actually, recently I actually tried WebStorm because like a lot of people internally were pinging me like, "Why not try it?" And like, and and then it's just yeah, sure. Like I had a license uh, because yeah. over the DD program you get some licenses from there from them as well. Nice. And so I tried to play around with it, and and it's actually not bad. But I I I, I find myself nowadays kind of jumping back and forth between web store and VS code and like, yeah, depending on, on what I want to do. Like there's still, still some things which in VS code are super nice, like mm -hmm. search and replace with regex stuff. And so which is super nice and like how they present it to you and how interactively you can like control what gets replaced, whatnot. Yeah. So it's, it's well, for me, it's kind of back and forth. Yeah. I, I started with web storm. Um, so I, I like, I like had a period where I'd, um, like all my Java stuff, uh, I really hated one of my not liking it was just like we, we were forced into some uh, older IDEs at, at my job just for like the different frameworks we were using. Mm -hmm. But whenever we I could use whatever framework I wanted, I loved the JetBrains stuff for that. So like, well, I think it was called like the idea, the um, something like that. But WebStorm yeah, was like yeah. JavaScript version, and so I, I jumped into that when when I first started getting into Angular. And it was good, it was all right, but it was like, it felt like if you wanted to get some of the cooler integrations in, it took a lot of work to get that stuff. And it was then super customized to you. So that's that's part of why I switched to VS Code uh, because you know I went, when I went there, it felt like it was, it was just so much easier to add stuff in. <laughs> like you just hit the plugin and hit install and that's it. There's no like two hours yeah. of configuration and like I had my own color scheme in, in WebStorm and I, I like I had spent five hours on it at some point and I got to the point where I really wasn't liking the color scheme anymore and I was like I really just don't want to bother with it though <laughs> so I don't know VS yeah, Code seems more yeah. out of the box to me that's that's my opinion but yeah yeah, yeah. I still use data grip sometimes that's like the the JetBrains um data one for like uh, if i work with sql i still like using data grip for that but mm -hmm. yeah uh, i've never gotten super big into dot net though yuri is that i mean i i've i remember in high school we did stuff with like i think that was before dot net so this is like visual basic six was the was the thing i had a class on and they had like the the microsoft developer network uh, like all the documentation, like right there, and that was super cool to work with. But 
like we never did anything with like networking or databases or anything like that. And it seems like that's what mainly what .NET's about. Is that is that accurate or? Yeah, there are multiple parts. Like it depends where you start with. Like I also played around with VB6 uh, at the time where when I basically got it a bit into programming and, and did VB8, like in mm. Excel and, and and Word. And I also uh, got the license for uh, Visual Studio. Was it called Visual Studio at that time as well? I think so. Like where you could program VB6. I don't remember. Like it was like yeah. a similar IDE. Sure. Where... Visual Studio. Yeah. Yeah, could be. Um, but yeah, the .NET is like a lot of different things. Like usually .NET is just a language and, and like .NET coupled with C Sharp uh, or whatever you're using or VB. Uh, mm -hmm. But nowadays, like most people, I think default to C Sharp. Uh, but then it's really like what you're using outside of it. Like what are you doing like web programming? Uh, yeah, it could be that it's just called Visual Basic at the time, yeah. I think Visual Basic was the name of the language, but like the IDE that it was in yeah. was... Visual Studio, I'm pretty sure. And you get you like plug in the different languages or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. So it really depends like in which direction you go, because like you can program desktop applications with like I think like they have even there like two different variations, like uh, web forms, which is I think like no uh WinForms, which is like I think deprecated, I think. And then there's like VPF Windows Presentational Foundation or something like that. So and then there's the whole web department part. And I mostly I developed one application that was based on the vpf platform of .NET, but mostly was also just like web applications okay and there we start from like web uh, .NET, um asp.net and then later the web apis and that's already the time where we then transitioned more to client server applications in the sense of like javascript heavy applications with apis on, on the back end side and mm -hmm. like transitioned more into that direction that was also when i kind of got into more the javascript parts because we found that like, like ASP.NET brings you to a, a given point, but then people, like th it was kind of that transition phase where people used applications like Gmail and stuff where they had all that, that interactivity. And they kind of were starting to complain, like we want to have the same on, on that side, right? Like at work, when I'm using your applications, they are slower. They are not reacting the same way like, like Gmail does, right? Why, why yeah. can't I have that one? Yeah. And so that's when I, when we started to do app, more. Right? Being in the browser, that's like, yeah. you, you just don't have as much access to like a native app would. So it's... Yeah, and then the whole ASP.NET platform, like the, the web platform was, was based on the idea of bringing like the normal desktop application model into the web, right? Where yeah. people wouldn't even know like how the whole HTTP part works. Right. Uh, because like they just like hit a button, they they stick it together like with a designer, and then like they rendered the web form actually, and then when they pressed, it would automatically do the post message, all the stuff, right? So yeah. you, you didn't even have to know you're doing web. It felt yeah. really like just doing desktop applications. Did that hold up? I feel like <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, the point was that if you knew the internals a bit, then you could actually go pretty a long way with that. But okay. since the whole state was kind of serialized, obviously, into some large, like, kind of string view state, it was called, it was kind of sent back and forth in the requests, that yeah. might have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger, and therefore also the application got slower, right? Yeah. But I still remember that at, at that company, when we transitioned to the front end part, which I was kind of in charge of, like, kind of teaching people internally about JavaScript stuff. And I remember, like, the older people there were kind of older, like, the more senior, if you want, were kind of like, you don't really want us to do the JavaScript, really, right? Like because really they knew what JavaScript was about, but they, they couldn't imagine like programming something like real, right? Some some logic with JavaScript. And and during those sessions, when I when I basically explained how the whole HTTP part works and like what you need to do, like with the whole like doing HTTP gets and posts and puts and stuff like that, they didn't like they programmed for twenty plus years, but it didn't. Some were not even aware what they were doing, like in the sense what is going on behind the scenes. Yeah, and that's because like the, it was completely like taken away from them with the whole model that ASP.NET Web Forms had. So that's crazy. I can't I can't like fathom that how, how you could how you could be coding web applications without like even understanding like basic stuff like the how how does this work with the browser? So. That's super interesting. Why? Why do you felt like they they had an aversion to JavaScript? The more the more senior engineers, could you get a sense? Was it just like 
a bad image of JavaScript. Yeah, yeah, it was definitely a bad image. Also because like JavaScript, that it, it was at the very beginnings, like where it was also jQuery was still already pretty strong. Mm -hmm. And so they might have used jQuery already, like for augmenting their web pages a bit, like for, with more dynamic behavior. Uh, but it wasn't really something where they would say like, okay, I, I'm coding my whole logic there, like the whole routing, client-side routing and, and those things, right? And I just fetched the data from the server via some API and render that. So that was something they, I think like it was, they, they, people couldn't really imagine doing something like that and having a maintainable app in the end, right? So that was yeah. the main problem. And you really had to, to like just hacking it together with jQuery didn't work. Right, because like that would get you a messy set of JavaScript files just thrown together and loaded yeah. into the HTML page without even bundling and minifying anything of that. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you had to have some kind of framework behind the scenes, which is like then where actually Angular and stuff came into place, which which helped you, right? Right. Well, so so um but by the time you're getting into this this JavaScript work, are are SPAs, single page applications, are they like the norm already or is... They started to get some some popularity. Like okay. that was when they started to to get like some upward trends. I mm -hmm. think like AngularJS was already around, but like the very first versions, like even below 1.0, I didn't pay too much attention at that time to the Angular community. Like as mentioned, we I used or we used a different framework there, which to be honest, like I think it was really ahead of its time because like it had already like the whole code generation which we have nowadays in Angular, which we we kind of feel is normal, like right, like you you have facilities that generate your code or modify your code. And yeah. there were already code generation capabilities there, um, minification bundling with like even like closure and stuff like okay. that. So it was really like advanced. Also the compression in the end, which you got out, like you got just a compiled set of JavaScript files. The problem was just like that there wasn't too much community behind it. Like it was also really easy to start with because like if you had some idea of jQuery, then the operators were the same. It was more kind of, if you want organizing your jQuery code in a proper way, like in that at that time, still like model view controller fashion, yeah. Um, but all with all the facilities around of linting and and like yeah, minification and bundling and which which you had. The yeah. problem was just as I said, the, the community, the lack of community, and so whenever you had an issue, you were mostly on your own. Like you had to figure it out. There was some some online forum, but it was really just a couple of people around. So, yeah, makes sense. Well, the, the reason I ask that is it feels to me like um, when you start moving into SBAs, it starts being like, okay, well now now we're working in a distributed system. Like I feel like, um, so I, I got started in web development when Angular 2 drops, uh, I think that was in September of 2016. And um, yeah, I just, um, it, it always felt like a distributed system to me. Like here's one app running on your client here's another app or some some other apps sitting out on the servers and you got to figure out you got to like understand the communication between those two things and it feels like before you get to sbas especially um it's more just the the only real ner node there is the server right like yeah. this the server's just like here's here you go here, i'm serving you your pages and yeah sure there's some javascript that's going out there too that's going to like make things a little dynamic for you and like tell you how to communicate back to me. But yeah, it's, it's, it's like, it, it felt very much like a parent child relationship before, yeah. before SBAs. Whereas when you get to SBAs now it's, it's real, it's peers. I feel like peers, two peer level systems talking to each other. Just one happens yeah, to be yeah. inside your browser. So. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean like the, 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 the tough, like it has pros and cons in general. Like I feel like when we just did the server side part, where you basically had not SPAs, but you like rendered the HTML on the server side out to the client and back and forth, basically. You're right. Then the, the 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 main I think difficulties which were always there is kind of how do I deal with the session? Like where do you store information that user? Like where do you keep the state? Right, which isn't state I want to necessarily put in the database because they just temporarily like for this authentication session. And so yeah. you had all those strange ways of like either embedding it in HTML and sending it back and forth, but you had to encrypt it. And then, like I mentioned, ASP.NET Web Forms or, or even JSP page like kind of had those facilities to help you with that. But it was always kind of like if you mess something up there, you might have really a lot of trouble on the server side, right? Because like just memories like piled up and you got all those issues there. And I feel like 
uh, like because I did both parts, right? I did code the front end, but also took care about the whole API store in the back end, the architecture there. And so once we got into those more like stateless backends, it was really like, ah, oh, this is so nice, right? Because like the HTTP request comes in, you do your stuff, you do it as fast as you can, and then it's gone, right? You start all over, right? There's no state, there's no anything being kept there, right? So on the server side, it was really super helpful. The only yeah. thing is that now you transition it to the client, right? <laughs> then yeah. there you have the whole problem of how do I keep state? Where do I store it? And Yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. I, I've thought a lot about these problems too, Yuri, and I think I feel like there's some some answer in in WebSockets. Uh, that that kind of like destroyed the stateless server part of it, but <laughs> like it, it feels a lot like what the kind of things we're doing with like NGRX when you get into that stuff, like the the message, the idea of this uh, messaging system where it's it's all it's all inside the client. Or our client Angular app, but we're saying let's dispatch a new action. Like that's that's essentially a message that's going and getting yeah. processed by our uh, by our uh, JavaScript application, and then you know states churning. It feels like we could easily do that on on a server just just as easily. And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there there are actually like uh, if you uh, actually when I went into the front end part when the whole um, Redux pattern came out, like in the yeah. React world, uh, that immediately like like lighted up some lights on, on my side because like on the backend side you had already those patterns like you had already yeah. the how was it called a cqrs pattern like the common query segregation principle something like that where yeah. you basically divide things up into like something which dispatches action and modifies your database and something that just reads and you have like different models like just as you have now with the selectors and ngrx right which yeah. are those that are the reading parts which like take data out and stream it as fast as possible to ui and the dispatching parts where you can basically transition, um, like, yeah, modify state, basically, in that case, in the database. But those patterns have been already there, and they kind of were, it felt like when, when people came out with it on the front end side, it felt like we found something new. And I was like, not really, right? <laughs> I mean, like, <laughs> this is not so different. Like, the implementations of it is different, but the concept is pretty much the same or very similar. Um, it's just that in the back end side, you you use those patterns really just like on really large and heavy systems where you needed like either the traceability that those actions give you because you have a kind of lock, right? Basically from right. that lock, you could reproduce your entire database at, at one point if you wanted without right, right, actually right. keeping the data. So uh, so it's, it's very interesting. I remember, uh, I think Trello, Trello at one point published uh, how they architected their applications. Which was really curious, like really interesting, because like they had already those like web sockety way of, of communication, right? Because like if you worked on the same Trello board in pairs, you see like the cars moving around and that, yeah. that high interactivity. And, and they shared actually at one point how they architected it on the backend side, which was very similar to having like dispatching actions against. I think like they used the Postgres database, and they replicated that into like a stream into web sockets and pulled it, pushed it back out to the client basically. Yeah, it was really smart and and yeah, made a lot of sense. So, but it's very, as you say, like totally agree. Like it's very similar to the whole NGRX and and Redux patterns in general. Super cool. So in Trello, can you actually see if someone like uh, I, I'm familiar with it, but I've never actually worked on it collaboratively. Like so, so there's the different. My it's like the different swim lanes when you put like cards. Yeah, into exactly. It. Do you actually see someone like dragging it around if they just like go in a circle? Do you see that? Or no, no, they don't. No, they don't replicate the exact like moving, right? Okay. Uh, at least they didn't when I used it last time. But like you, you see just a card like switch flipping over basically to another lane or like activating or changing the text or something like that. So they don't they show you the the in progress move, but like the final result, right? So you see like cards moving around basically, sweeping like jumping around basically from Makes one sense. lane to the other. But you never have to refresh the browser and anything like. That's really cool, I think, like in those, because you have that possibility, right, with WebSockets. Yeah. You can have all those high interactive pages. Yeah. Well, so um, in, some of the, in some of the applications I've worked on in the past, you know, just thinking of it, it this kind of gets to talking about these things as a distributed system rather than just like a, a parent-child. I feel like a lot of our paradigms are based on, still based on this parent-child relationship. Like rest calls and like um, like polling even like the idea mm -hmm. that like the idea that um, well 
so so we, we would have some tables uh, in, in our old application and we would expect like there's, there's actually hard limits that like there, there would never be more than 300 items uh, per, per the architecture um, that could potentially be in this table that, that we'd want to show to our user. And to me, like the way, the way I started thinking about this was, well, if there's only 300, let's just go get all of them. And then we can have like faster sorts and all this stuff because it doesn't have to do a round trip. And I don't have to, it will probably end up sending overall less data if I just get all 300 at once. Um, and the problem with that is, well, you don't know when that, when one of those things is going to change. So if, if you, if you have one where you like edit one, you have to go back and like either get that one specifically or get all 300 back to make sure, you know, we're, we're showing the right state to them. It's kind of because we, you just have this, like, it's like a one-sided conversation between the two systems. Um, you, you have to do some like really inefficient stuff where you either like get all of them every time you hit this page or something like that, or every time some change could happen. Um, it's kind of a shame. Like that, this is where the, the WebSockets really comes up to me. Like we could make this much more efficient. Uh, I yeah, think Peter and I had, had some of these conversations too, because I think he, he really suggests uh, GraphQL over WebSockets for this. And it seems like, like the right solution because it should just be like the optimal way to get this information and still have like these really, really fast, like uh, sortings and all that stuff. Cause it's all client side would be, give me all the data at front and then I'll just listen to this web socket and you tell me if anything changes and that's all it is <laughs> like that, that should be all it has to be. And um, that, that should give us like the optimal, the, the least amount of communication overall between the stuff. And yes, it's, uh, maybe still a downside of you, you have this upfront cost of having to get this larger request at the start. But I think th there's even stuff you could do with that too, where you like, if you could um, persist that into like local storage or something like that and, and have like some, some other request that says, here's, here's what we got. Here's what's in our local storage. Let me know if any of these are wrong and then just give me the new ones, the, the new ones that, that aren't accurate yet. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, uh, and, and in a previous job, and, and that was actually something I wanted to try, I wanted to implement before I left, but I left them before, yeah. which was also like a very heavy data-driven application where you basically have just, like imagine uh, porting old server-side PHP rendered pages to some modern architecture, right? Like what do you do in initially? Like you, you start kind of replicating many parts, right? Like you have always the kind of a uh, list, like filters on top of like a data grid and stuff like that. And so there what happens, like you, you make REST calls, right? You call like when you page back and forth in the data grid, you just call again like server side. And so you could even like combine it. Like if you know there won't never be more than 300 records in there, just get them all, right? Like the yeah. overhead of doing the HTTP call is probably like worse doing it multiple times and just like getting all of them. But then obviously you have to think about how do I keep those up to date? Because like now I have like two places where they are stored or where they live potentially. And they're having something like a, a channel from the server to the client is, is super cool, right? Because mm -hmm. like then you could actually do a lot of like really interesting caching mechanisms where you, as you say, like just integrate it with the new data that comes from the server. Yeah. It could even be just like a stupid broadcasting mechanism where you kind of filter them out then and like you progress from there, right? Yeah. Uh, the problem so I think is mostly always the, the server side infrastructure. And that's what kind of people hold back a bit. Like yeah. Obviously, now you don't have those like stateless REST machines, right? But you have to think more about the architecture on the server side where you kind of, how do I pipe something into that channel that communicates with the clients? How do I keep the connections to the clients, right? And so... Yeah. Well, I think you could do something that's like relatively stateless still, right? Where, where at least it doesn't care about the session. Like there, there, should be, there should be no session data the server needs to actually maintain I think in in one of these uh, in a possible implementation where all you need is like the the client is maybe just responsible for saying uh, this is a collection I want to watch sort of thing and uh, I think yeah. Firebase actually I, I've done this I've done very similar things on Firebase because um, you can actually ha set it up to listen to a collection to say okay yeah. let me know if there's there's been an insert or an edit or a delete so that that's what I'll do on Firebase all the time I think I I've got like this snippet of ngrx code <laughs> that i write so i can make sure it's all getting into the ngrx uh store but then like uh 
and what I'll do is I'll just get it all at the start and, you know, then just listen. If, if something gets added, go ahead and add that to my store, you know? So that that's kind of cool to work with, but it still feels like, like the, the way Firebase uh, works is it's going off of reads. So that initial get at, give me all 500 things <laughs> it can be very expensive. Uh, so it would be nice if we, if I could figure out that part where it's like, okay, let's see if we can figure out only what changed from like maybe what's in my local storage state. So I only need yeah. to get a few more things or the, the things that actually changed. So I don't know that, that the, just the idea of like working with that kind of architecture though, seems, seems so much nicer. Um, yeah, it's super neat. Like, especially because you mentioned Firebase, like. Uh, whoever created an app with Firebase with those real data, which you get streamed down into the client, is super nice, right? You, yeah. you, you don't have to do anything with like the whole infrastructure that gives you that for free, basically. You yeah. just to make sure you have to make sure basically that you hook it up in the right way, and then you have like full real time Angular apps or whatever you create and, and without any effort, right? Yeah, I think well, like I in real enterprise apps, the most things that hold back is usually uh, because like teams are separate, right? And so as I said, like for those real-time communication, you need some server-side part, right? That handles yeah. that, that somehow, you, you have to kind of think more about art, uh, that architecture. And obviously as a front-end engineer, you say like, look, this is super cool because like, first of all, you can help me as a front-end ar- ar- like front engineer a lot more because like I get data streamed down, I can basically do a lot more sophisticated caching than doing stupid fetches all the time, right? <laughs> and the user gets a lot of benefits because like the UI is super like- oh, yeah. Yeah. But then there's the backend engineer, which kind of sa- doesn't really oh, often, not always, of course, like, but often doesn't really understand the problem, right? But it means a lot more maintenance on his side, a lot more, like maybe even setting up because like maybe it's all based on Java or .NET stack, right? And so yeah. .NET has some real-time communication mechanisms there, but like most often people kind of default to some Node.js server, which just is streaming because it's just more efficient for handling yeah. like multiple connections and that stuff. And so that would mean like, setting up a dedicated server for that client communication and WebSocket streaming, for instance, just for having that real-time communication, which usually is really hard to get there, right? Unless you have some cross, cross-functional cross teams where mm-hmm. like you, you kind of have both parts that, that decide on the architecture, be it on the backend and on the front end, then it works much nicer usually. But in my experience, that's where people kind of hold back because it's kind of that new, strange, also with GraphQL. When you explain GraphQL to someone uh, which does mostly backend coding, right? Which yeah. where they're like, they don't really see the necessity for it because like they export you the data, they are in control of what data gets exported, right? And so when you come with GraphQL, a lot of people actually misunderstand that concept. Like they say like, I'll never give you access to my full database table. What are you talking about, right? Yeah. And so you have to have a long time where you explain them basically, look like this doesn't mean I can query the entire database. It's always like you deciding what collection you expose and how much you expose to me, right? But it's usually it's that kind of communication which is the difficult part, I think. Because yeah. the tech part is super easy afterwards. My 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 impression of it, Yuri, and, and I'd be interested if you agree. I, I feel like it's it's uh I think you're getting to this with, with your explanation too. I feel like a lot of it is just convention. Like we've been stuck in the in the rest world for so long and it's it's served us pretty well. Well, like you said, just getting rid of session stuff to be stateless. Um that's that's a huge boon. But um just, just like I feel like the web is evolving to the point where like front end applications deserve more respect. <laughs> you know, they're <laughs> they're a peer, they're a peer application to all of this stuff on the back end. Um, I feel like uh, I hope something like this will become like the norm uh, in over time. Um, it, it might. I feel like it, it will take a little while uh, because, like you said, I don't think um, I don't think these problems are well understood because they're relatively recent. I feel like, like just um, yeah. before FBAs, I don't see a, a, a need for any of this, right? No, so. no, absolutely not. And yeah, that, that does, that's also where the kind of the, the front end development scene has that image, right? It's kind of just like that hacky scripts, which makes some dynamic behavior. And I think like that really improved a lot in recent years because like people kind of start to understand, well, look now the, the main logic, the interaction logic sits on the client actually. It's not the server yeah. anymore that deals with it. And so yeah. sure, like the server has its job, it needs to be performed, it needs to perform the, the crucial business logic because you don't want to have that on a client, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in the end, uh, it, the front, I think like the front end development gets a lot more respect over time. It already improved a lot. Like even well, like I- if you think about 
having like terms such as like like even job descriptions like front end architect like even just think about that term right like i, I remember like th six years ago if you architecture on a front end for what right there is nothing yeah. to architect right it's just like throwing out html you right? out those tags <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah there's not nothing more to it but that changed a lot in recent years so yeah well, I, I like just the web is changing too, to where, to where there's a lot of like leftover stuff. Um, well, like uh, if you look at us now, like right now I have on my screen two like really complicated applications that, that for like even it would be weird. It would, it would almost be weird for these to be native applications right now with StreamYard <laughs> in, in one browser and in my other browser, I'm looking at Twitch just to make sure like the stream's going all right. And it's like these things like, these are not web pages. These are applications that just happen to be running in a browser. Yeah, sure. And um, but yeah, there's there's just like a lot of leftover stuff. Like StreamYard's pretty much like it doesn't feel like a, a website, but Twitch kind of does. Um, so I don't know. I feel like I feel like uh, just as this kind of stuff evolves, and like the more they'll they'll be uh, the expectation of the user is to have more you know functionality and more application like stuff inside of websites. So I don't know. Absolutely. I don't know. As, as that, as that continues to, if that continues uh, trending that way, I think, um, I think we'll see a lot more of these paradigms come over. So we're running out of time though. And I, I wanted to talk with you about Twitter a little bit and like content creation and stuff. Oh. I, I, I really admire you and what you've been able to accomplish. Like I remember when I was first getting into angular, I kind of look for your stuff and you, you were like the guy that had like the arm like this. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was like, that guy's kind of cool. <laughs> but yeah, I, I remember looking for your stuff at some times and just curious, like, you know, how, how do you do that? Did you ever set out to like be influential or did you just want to share or how, how did you, how did you get into this space? Like where, where you go from just being a developer to kind of like being an advocate or an influencer or something like that? No, that was never, never the goal. Never. <laughs> yeah. No, really. It, it just like grow over the years. Like I had a blog for basically forever. I think like the last entry on my blog is probably for more than 10 years ago. Uh, but I had one even before that, right. Which like older blog posts, which I didn't ever migrate. And that was mostly, yeah, it's better it's no more around because it was mostly silly stuff, which like news about what Google released or Gmail and stuff like that. But I always liked it to fiddle around with my own website. Like I basically I learned HTML and CSS there, like just mm -hmm. like looking at our websites, kind of understanding how their CSS lays out stuff and learning CSS to implement it on my own site. And the content production is, I started usually like just documenting whatever I encountered at work. And in fact, like when you look at my blog post, you kind of see what I did over the years. Like when I did more.net, you see more.net articles, like how to resolve stuff with like energy framework to access databases, which is when I did backend stuff, which was like for me documenting stuff. And especially when you see them people interacting with it, or you see like more hits on like Google Analytics or whatever you're using for tracking, uh, then you kind of get motivated, right? You see like people actually read that, right? Like initially yeah. it was mostly for me to write it down. And then especially if you write it down, then Sometimes you even learn more about it. Like you said, you have to really think about how to actually articulate yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. You kind of oh. copy and paste stuff in. My my um my imposter uh, syndrome gets like mega activated when I try to write a blog article to the point where I like I gotta know this because someone's gonna call me out on Twitter for being this <laughs> yeah. wrong, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> now really just like started pushing out content that way, and then like over over the years, but really like we're talking about ten plus years, it started to grow more. Mm. Um, yeah, and then from there, I kind of continued. Like, I enjoy it. Like, from now, now and then, I enjoy writing an article or I recently doing videos, which I kind of just discovered in the last three, four years or so. Mm -hmm. That That's something that I really like to do. So, yeah, it kind of grew over time, but never really something I, I plan out. And, and, and I think, like, that's also what often works best when you just, like, throw out content. Like, even yeah. if it's not super polished, because like you can always come like the, even the thing with blog posts, right? You can always come back and and fix it, edit it, add new stuff. It, it doesn't have to be like a one one shot and then that's it, right? Because it has that data on it. Yeah. Uh, actually, sometimes it would even be better to just remove the data and just like have it as an article standing out there, which you keep up as long as it is relevant, and then just like drop it whenever 
it's no more relevant. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, the uh, we had Brian Love on earlier this week, and he showed off Lookout.dev, which I thought was like an interesting take. It's kind of like the the way Brian described it is like Stack Overflow, but for learning rather than like okay. proactive learning rather than reactive learning. So yeah. the idea was like uh, you, you would you would just put something out, and it would be like very low expectation. Like I learned this thing today, like a today I learned kind of thing. But um, the the idea would be like there'd be heavy, ideally there'd be heavy interaction where like people would say, hey, I learned this too. Like this is similar. And then um, as these, as you incorporate the discussions, you could kind of like update the original article to say, okay, we're, we're growing this thing over time. Like at, at first, this is what I learned, but now I'm learning X, Y, and Z, and those have all been incorporated. And before you know yeah. it, you've got like decent content there that you can share or you know, write a blog post on or make a video about or stuff like that. So very interesting. Yeah, I think like the, the, the biggest part to overcome is that, as you say, like, but that that's normal. Like I had it as well, like that fear to make it perfect, right? To make a yeah. properly written article, like properly researched from the very beginning to the end and, and things like that. So, and actually, uh, Joel Hooks from Egghead has that concept. I think I already talked to you about that, about digital garden. Uh, which is basically just having a collection of articles up there, which I even you can even mark them as like, look, this is, I don't know, research in progress or work in progress, whatever, right? But just mm -hmm. a place where you can just write it down because people will still find it over Google and they, they might even find it useful, right? Even if though yeah. it's like incomplete, just a part of it, of the problem or, um, but it helps you like get things out and, and get started. And then over time you can like refine them in more elaborate articles and stuff, so. Yeah, yeah. So, so when when Brian Love was on the show, he mentioned uh, yeah. Joel Hook's idea of the digital garden. Sam Julien has also mentioned that too when he was on. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely a, a cool idea. I got I've. Got, it seems like a really good solution to what I'm trying to do. And like we we've had this discussion before too, Yuri, where I just feel like, how do I get more time? Like, how do I get more efficient? Yeah. Well, that's an order, That's a whole other problem. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I feel like this this really helps with that because like my, my problem isn't really I don't have enough time. It's I don't have enough time to accomplish these things. And if this if this this is a mode of like, well, um, a lot of a lot of times I'll work on something and then that value gets lost, right? Mm -hmm. And but if we're exactly. if you have this digital garden, uh, just taking like a minute out of your day to like plant something in the garden that that could maybe grow later, that's huge, right? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, and I actually wanted to to have that on my blog as well again. Because like the concept is not new at all. Like I remember I think Martin Fowler brought that up. Like he had a, a section on his blog, uh, which I read a lot, like yeah, in terms because he talks a lot about architecture and general, general things in, in computer science. And he had a section at some point which he called Blicky, which was like a merging of, of wiki and blog, right? Because it was a blog kind of article, but still wiki in the sense of like he will he would come back and edit it, right? Which is the exact same thing as the digital garden, right? And yeah. and I even had it at one point at my my own website, my own blog. Uh, but kind of I don't know why, but I kind of forgot about it over the years. And then Jewel, like Joel, like kind of brought it back up with the digital garden. And I read the article he wrote. It was like, damn, that's the exact same idea that 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 Martin kind of brought up. But he kind of revived it, re brought it up again, and reformalized it properly. So that's really I think it's really a nice nice idea. That's awesome, man. Yeah, well, I have to. I feel like I have to like mess around with this idea too, see how I can get it to work well for me. But definitely, yeah, yeah. It's cool stuff. Yuri, it's been an hour already. Can you believe it? Well, wow. <laughs> time flies. I'll have to get you back on. I've got a hard stop today, unfortunately. But I, I feel like we were get, we still have some more stuff to talk about, or more stuff. I'd yeah, for sure. But um, yeah, thanks, thanks for coming by and. Uh, Thanks everyone for in chat for for coming by and hope you all have a great weekend and a great rest of your Friday. This was really awesome. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Definitely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. See y'all. <laughs>